Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel where skincare is all about progression over perfection because perfection doesn't exist. And welcome back to another When Beauty Turns Ugly. I had to, mm, I had to not do last week's because it was meant to be this one, but the more and more I read into this lawsuit and what's going on here, the more it got confusing really confusing. I ended up downloading over a hundred documents about this lawsuit. There's recorded interviews, there's email evidence to go through, there is so studies that I didn't quite understand so I had to get some help on those. <laughs> but there's so much going on in this lawsuit and I think it's pretty much changed everything I thought I knew about St. Ives Apricot Scrub. You're gonna have to bear with me through this one because there's a lot and I'm gonna be going back and forth a lot. If the skincare world was a Disney movie, St. Ives Apricot Scrub would be the villain. Dermatologists and skinfluencers alike have actually warned us for years and years now about the supposed dangers, the alleged dangers of using St. Ives apricot scrub, walnut apricot scrub. Basically, if we want to keep our skin, don't use it. That's what we're told. And on that note, before I get into today's video, this video is purely for entertainment purposes. I'm not a lawyer. We know that. I know I have no legal um, experience and everything in this video is just alleged in my opinion. And you know, just for fun. So of course I have just come out the shower and in this video we will be testing some St. Ives products that I didn't even know existed. And we do of course have the Fresh Skin Apricot Scrub. So let's go back a bit. St. Ives, we all know them. If you are a millennial, it was probably the first exfoliant you ever used. If not the first skincare product you were probably ever introduced to. It is an icon, whether you love it or hate it, within the skincare world, right? St. Ives have actually been around since the 1950s. And they stood out because of their 100% natural marketing claims, but also their Swiss formula, which I couldn't really make sense of. But the Apricot Apricot Scrub only kind of became the most popular and default physical exfoliant in the early 90s because it was a lot cheaper than the um, Apricot Scrub rival at the time, Apri. Throughout the next 10 to 15 years, we'd get so many variations of the St. Ives Apricot Scrub, the Ultra Gentle, the Blemish Control, Blackhead Control, and also at one point there was an anti-aging take on the Apricot Scrub. I'm not sure. I don't know. But it's really around the early 2000s when the hate train for St. Ives kind of really picked up with the kind of introduction of online reviews and beauty forums. The original beauty forum Makeup Alley would be one of the first places where the press really picked up on the pure hatred for St. Ives Apricot Scrub, calling it out for being a skin damaging product. With people actually complaining about how painful the product was to use and that actually made some people bleed. I don't know what they were doing with it to make them bleed, but yeah. So in September of 2010, Unilever bought Alberto Culver, the company who actually owned St. Ives for an estimated 3.7 billion. They were really popular back then, really popular. And despite being like a celebrity favorite and a multi-award winner, the internet is filled with negatives about using a physical scrub and reasons why you shouldn't use physical scrubs on your face. And St. Ives just happens to be the poster child for that hate. But 2016 is when things really started to kick off. So I'm gonna start first of all using the St. Ives Cleansing Stick. This has cactus water and hibiscus, and it says instantly hydrates, softens skin as you cleanse. Um, I've not opened this yet, so we'll open it together, but I really like cactus water as an ingredient, as a hydrating ingredient, usually in toners. This is not how I'd usually wash my face, but you know, when you're in front of a camera at a desk, you have to do what you can. Ooh. Oh, that smells really good. It's a little bit creamier than I thought it was and I accidentally ate a bit there just now. Oh, it feels almost like really squishy Vaseline. So I'm gonna do this in my drier areas here because I have another face wash I wanna show you. I mean, it feels good. It smells a little bit, um, it's got some very obvious added fragrances in, which I quite like. It smells like the pink Starburst that you only get in America. Oh, it's kind of falling apart. This feels like a cleansing balm in a stick form. It actually feels really gentle on the skin. Foams up nicely and smells quite nice too. Let's wash it off and see how drying it is. I think that's the thing with St. Ives is a lot of people find it drying. But no, I kind of like this so far. I can't see the rest of the ingredients because they're all kind of blurred out. It's basically got a load of nice oils in. The fragrance. Hmm. You know what? I don't hate that. My skin actually feels really nice and soft. Like it feels really unbothered, a little bit red, but my skin's very reactive. So it does react to me touching it in any way whatsoever. But I don't hate that. This just felt like a cleansing balm in stick form. Not bad. 
I mean, who honestly knew they did anything other than a scrub? I didn't. <laughs> December 2016. Amazon announces its first delivery by drone, which they've done absolutely nothing about since, so useless. And the month Kaylee Browning and Sarah Basil file a lawsuit against Unilever and St. Ives. I'm gonna start looking at my notes now because there's a lot going on. The lawyers representing Browning and Basil are Bursa and Fisher. They're known for their lawsuits against Crest Toothpaste, the only toothpaste I really, really like. <laughs> Does anyone have a toothpaste preference? I feel like people do. Cases against Playboy and they seem to be the lawyer firm to go to if you've got a problem with your fridge for some reason. I don't know. You may also recognize them as the lawyers representing presented the plaintiffs in the Yes To face mask lawsuit that we spoke about a while back. Browning and Basil, Basil were suing because they claim that two versions of St. Ives apricot scrub, the original and the blemish control, which both use finely ground walnut shell powder as the exfoliant, cause micro tears. We're gonna be hearing this term a lot. You've already heard it a lot but we're gonna be talking about it a lot today. A type of skin damage, they say, may not immediately be noticeable to the naked eye, but it nonetheless leads to acne, infection, and wrinkles. And ultimately claiming that they had professional and scientific evidence that St. Eyes was unfit to be sold as a skincare product. Really, a really big claim. As we've seen from the cases we've talked about previously, it takes a lot to prove that a skincare product shouldn't be sold. But they go on to say that Unilever, Unilever, yeah, failed to disclose the unreasonable safety hazard, so plaintiff's argument goes and must refund everyone's purchase price. So, so Browning and Basil are basically saying that they are representing hundreds of other people who want to sue St. Ives because their apricot scrub is a hazard that causes micro tears, that leads to acne, wrinkles, and irritation or something. What was it? <laughs> Infection. Infection. I'm just gonna say my brief history with St. Ives Apricot Scrub, the first scrub I ever used. I would use this until my skin was red raw, not because that's what the Zyre Erection said to do, but because back then I believed exfoliation was removing the top layer of skin, and if you scrub hard enough, it does the best job, and it was the only scrub I used probably for about 10 years, probably into my early 20s. So let's talk a little bit more about their claims and the so-called evidence they have to back up micro tears, because we've not seen a lot of evidence of what micro tears really are. We're told that micro tears are caused by jagged exfoliating pieces, cutting the skin, causing little micro tears, allowing things to penetrate the skin and causing infection and premature aging and damage and all this kind of stuff. And according to the lawsuit, their claims are backed up by other dermatologists and skincare professionals who routinely speak out against consumers, patients using St. Ives apricot scrub and other products that contain crushed walnut shell. So the first bit of evidence, this is the big scientific evidence that, you know, they're using as the, the main evidence against St. Ives. And that first bit of evidence is a 2015 article from New York Magazine, where one dermatologist says that basically using St. Ives apricot scrub is like scrubbing sandpaper over your face, which in turn speeds up the aging process. So exhibit one, a blog post. But hang on, so exhibit two of the big scientific evidence is another blog post from New York Magazine again, <laughs> where they interviewed another dermatologist who said, large hard and sand like rocks like the ones in St. Ives apricot scrub are the most damaging because they are too abrasive for the face's thin skin. Exhibit A and exhibit B are both blog posts from a New York Magazine article. So we must be coming onto the big science, right? So exhibit C is another article <laughs> where a medical esthetician at Toronto Dermatology Center warns, we don't want to use anything that has walnut shells. They're not round and they can tear at the living cells. Okay, so the rest of the evidence, because there's more evidence, you guessed it, they're all blog posts and articles. But this is a When Beauty Turns Ugly video, so we must have some visual proof about these claims, some visual skin damage, some slightly gory pictures that none of us really want to look at. Visual proof of what the plaintiffs here are experiencing. Acne, irritation, proof of premature aging. I don't know how you prove that. Or any kind of irritation that was caused by St. Ives apricot scrub. But no, there, there's nothing because Browning and Basil, in fact, haven't experienced any of these alleged side effects. So Basil and Browning, who are filing a lawsuit against St. Ives for um, damage to their skin, haven't experienced any damage to their skin. That's why there's no evidence. 
So what the fuck's going on? Okay, let's quickly use um, another cleanser. This is St. Ives Hydrating Daily Daily Facial Cleanser Watermelon. Leaves skin hydrated and glowing. So I'm excited to use this because I quite like that cleanser just then. And I'm a fan of anything hydrating. Oh, that smells like American watermelon. You know, the artificial watermelon fragrance. I'm just gonna do this on the forehead because I don't wanna dry out my skin too much. The, again, I'm not looking at the ingredients right now, but feeling wise, this feels like a very typical gentle cleanser. You know, those not really crazy foaming, non-stripping ones that is kind of the gold standard of any cleanser that you launch nowadays. It feels nice. It smells, if you don't like artificial fragrance, you would hate it. But yeah, let's wash it off and see. I'm not gonna look at the ingredients because sometimes I find ingredients can sway me. I'd be like, oh, it's got that in. It should be drying then. And I'm like, oh, am I dry? This, is, this isn't this is like a St. Ives review video anyway. No, my skin feels really good. <laughs> Listen, let me just say, I know I'm like the first two products, but I do, I'm not a fan of St. Ives in any way because I'm not a fan of their scrub, um, but I didn't know they did anything else. But my skin feels really nice and smooth from, from both cleansers. I'm actually pleasantly surprised. So th so why have they done this then? I don't, I don't understand, you don't understand, we don't understand. Well, it's because that was just a little bit of their lawsuit. The rest of their lawsuit was about fraud and false advertising. So they're suing Unilever for false advertising and false claims, false product claims. And a big part of this is that the packaging itself says dermatolog dermatologically tested on the front, but now dermatologists are saying they're useless. I, we've read these articles and these professionals, skincare professionals are saying that these products are now useless. Instead of exfoliating, they're ruining my skin? Well, I'm gonna sue St. Ives and Unilever then. So they are suing because they feel that they've been missold a product. They're suing because they find the term dermatologist tested misleading. Their claim is that no dermatologist would ever recommend this product. So why does it say dermatologist tested on the front? Well, we, we all know where this is gonna go. I need to do this for my own good. So let's just sum up what the lawsuit's actually for. So these two ladies haven't experienced any damage to their skin, but they're kind of like preemptively, preemptively? suing for the, for just in the, for the future, just in case, so. And now they're asking for five million in damages, not for themselves, but for themselves and everyone who they're representing in this case. So, you know, they all get a bit of the five million. Basically, this will refund everyone who purchased St. Ives, who has supposedly been missold St. Ives apricot scrub. So when I was reading this, I was like, what? Like all this time I was under the impression that this lawsuit came about because these people had taken St. Ives to court because they've completely destroyed their skin. They've caused these micro tears in their skin. Their skin's going to be really fucked up, irritated, red, itchy, inflamed. They're suffering from these so-called micro tears, which we all avoid physical exfoliants for now because we're worried about getting micro tears. Right, I'll be honest, my skin's feeling a little bit dry now. My forehead, not my cheeks. My cheeks are still really nice, but um, this isn't St. Ives, but for my own good, I'm going to apply the Avocado Ceramide Recovery Serum from Glow Recipe. Give my skin what it needs, some ceramide essential building blocks. So these micro tears, the more I looked into this lawsuit and the more we're gonna look at it today, the more you realize micro tears is kind of bullshit. I'm, I'm just telling you now, I'm not gonna be using the apricot scrub. I was going to, but I had um, a hydrofacial yesterday and I basically been told I'm not allowed to exfoliate. So sorry about that. <laughs> So now St. Ives have been served this lawsuit. Everyone's talking about it in court and Unilever like, according to our scientists and our dermatologists and our experts and every single dermatology journal out there, micro tears don't exist, they're not a thing. But according to the blogging world, they are. So after the court initially throwing that out of court because they had no evidence, the court basically looked at this and were like, you don't have evidence that this is happening. Like you come to us with a baseless claim because you read some blogs. Everyone was basically forced to go away and come back with some real hardcore solid evidence that these micro tears exist and this is what St. Ives does to your skin. We're looking at a lawsuit here. Both plaintiffs happily use St. Ives for the best part of a decade according to the lawsuit, according to their own words, their interviews in court. They had happily used St. Ives for years, for years. In fact, <laughs> Browning actually... <laughs> Wait, who? Browning actually only stopped using St. Ives, not because she got any irritation, not because it was damaging her skin, but because she accidentally got it in her eye. 
So she stopped using St. Ives Apricot Scrub because she got it in her eye and she didn't want to use it anymore. It did no damage to her skin. So from my understanding, it took a very long time to get this evidence together. Basil and Browning were literally scraping around to try and find some evidence. Again, from my very simple understanding of all the documents I downloaded, purchased, they were late in supplying this evidence and Unilever actually didn't want the court to allow this evidence, but they did. However, the evidence was allowed because they managed to get a dermatologist to run a clinical trial for two weeks to prove that St. Ives caused micro tears in the skin. That dermatologist is Mark S. Nestor, MD, PhD, FAAD. I don't know what that last bit means, but he earned it, so we're gonna use it. He was asked to provide expert testimony in this case and testify that the apricot scrub did in fact cause skin damage. According to the lawsuit, Nesta actually says that the problems that can be caused by St. Ives apricot scrub far outweigh any benefits and he would advise his patients against using this scrub. The declaration supplied by Mark S. Nesta actually goes on to list all of his achievements and experience and notes that he is also using many years of experience to come up with his conclusion. This man knows his stuff, he's done a lot, he's highly respected, published, and has so, so much experience. In this declaration, he actually goes on to explain a little bit about what transepidermal water loss is. If you don't know what that is, that's um, transepidermal water loss. That's when your skin barrier is um, basically impaired and water can easily come out of the skin. So you're losing a lot of hydration. And he explains how um, SLS and walnut shell can actually damage the skin barrier, leading to excessive transepidermal water loss. He then explains his clinical study and the findings and St. Ives might be in a little bit of trouble here. Maybe. So this is it. This is the big evidence that Basil and What's-Her-Face needed, um, but maybe it's not. Let's have a look at, at it here. So all in the words of Mark S. Nesta in his declaration, the object of the study was to investigate facial skin irritation and barrier function following the use of St. Ives apricot scrubs. The study examined 15 subjects during and after use of St. Ives per the manufacturer's directions for two weeks. Subjects were given St. Ives fresh skin apricot scrub in an unmarked container so as to prevent bias and were given the exact instructions for use that appear on the commercial product packaging. Moisten face with water, dispense product onto fingertips, and massage over face, rinse with water. The study included a total of seven study visits occurring throughout the two-week study. The visits occurred on days 0, 3, 7, 9, 11, and 14. At each visit, a device assessed the permeability barrier function by obtaining a directly measured value for the tool of the facial skin, transepidermal water loss of the skin. CCSER also conducted a series of local skin reaction assessments to directly measure irritation, including burning, stinging, and pain. So what's the conclusion? The conclusions were over the course of 14 days, the subject showed a significant disruption to normal barrier function, as demonstrated by the increased tool from the facial skin. In addition, the subject showed a significant increase in visual arrhythmia, which is redness, visual dryness, and self-reported tightness and dryness. These results indicate that the use of St. Ives as directed led to a compromised skin barrier function and impaired stratum corneum skin in study participants. So, it sounds really, really compelling, right? Like, oh my god, they probably have the evidence that they need right here. But, but did he notice something? Did he notice that he spends the majority of the time talking about transepidermal water loss. Looking at tool, not micro tears. In fact, the only time he mentions micro tears is when he's kind of floating around the ideas that came from the blog posts and magazine articles that were initially used as evidence. He says micro tears is a non-medical term that has been used to describe disruption of a stratum corneum and other parts of the epidermis. So essentially a slang term used by non-professionals to oversimplify what a damaged skin barrier is and how it can occur. That's what I think. The only other time, he only mentions micro tears twice, and the only other time he mentions this is when he quotes other dermatologists from, again, those magazine articles and blog posts. He says, it's my understanding that the term micro tears as used by these physicians <laughs> is lay terminology to describe the irritant effects and or damage to stratum corneum functionality, integrity caused by physical abrasion caused by scrubbing, transepidermal water loss, damaged skin barrier. He also goes on to say how this is mainly due to the jagged edges of the actual walnut particles in the, in the scrub itself. 
So basically, what has this proven? What has this study proven? Well, nothing about micro tears. Nothing. And that's, that's the point. <laughs> what this has proven is that exfoliation can impair the skin barrier. Which we all know, that's like skincare 101. We know, we know that. So can chemical exfoliants, so can active, so can a cleansing brush, a flannel, a cloth, a towel. One thing he also mentions is that the patients of the clinical study, subjects, patients, subjects, were to use no other skincare product. So they were just wetting their face, using St. Ives, apricot scrub, washing it off, and then doing nothing else. We'll come back to that. Now, what do you think is gonna happen? We'll do it now. What do you think is gonna happen? You use a scrub on your face and then use nothing else. And you're like, why is their skin dry? It's just stupid. It's so, we will come back to it again. It's just, it's just not, it's just not, if you use any product and then don't mo moisturize or don't have a good skincare routine to go along with it, if you use any exfoliant and don't moisturize, your skin's probably gonna feel dry. It's not a real representation of how this scrub is being used. I sound like St. I's biggest fan. I'm not, I'm just not a fan of stupidity is all. So again, of course, this does not stand up in court because there's no evidence. Where's the evidence? They're, they've still not proved that micro tears are a thing and that St. Ives apricot scrub causes micro tears or stands out in any other way to any other physical exfoliant or exfoliation. Now you would think surely St. Ives did their own studies right before. Isn't that what skincare brands do? They they trial their products and make sure that, you know, they're easy to use, safe to use. Their experts would have accounted for this and tested their little jaggedy walnut scrubby particles. Well, actually, by the sounds of it, according to leaked emails and the declarations in court, they kind of tested it but not as an exfoliant. In the deposition of Jeffrey Wojcicki, who was a scientist that works for Unilever, and St. Ives in particular, that's a lot of what I could find out. A lot of this stuff has been redacted, by the way. In the deposition, when questioned about in-house testing of St. Ives, apricot scrub, and all its similar products, all variations, Wojcicki basically says that in the testing, in the safety testing, in the irritation testing, you know, make, you know, all that kind of stuff, there's no scrubbing involved with apricot scrub. A small a diluted amount of St. Ives apricot scrub is put onto the subject's skin and left there for a while. So no scrubbing, they're just seeing whether the, any irritation is caused from the ingredients. So whilst this may have shown that soda laurel sulfate and salicylic acid dried out the skin, maybe irritated the skin, some of their scrubs may react on the skin, they never really tested the effects of the walnut scrub itself, the particles. Now, during this deposition itself, another interesting point is brought up. It appears that according to subpoenaed emails, there has always been an underlying concern from St. Ives about their jagged little walnut pieces. Not just raised by these online forums and the general public, but the actual supplier of the walnut shell themselves. In an email titled, Walnut Shell, good title, from a worker at Composition Materials, the, oh, I can't show these, I can't show these for legal reasons, sorry. The distributor of the walnut shell in St. Ives Apricot Scrub, the employee actually recommends that St. Ives use a finer grade of walnut shell in their scrubs. However, it's argued that this email is actually about a sensitive, a force sensitive skin version of their apricot scrub and not their scrubs overall. However, what did come from this email was the employee of Composition Materials saying that the grade they already use in their apricot scrub of walnut shell was too aggressive. So inspired by this email chain, St. Ives decided to do their own investigation to the claim um, that their little walnut pieces were jaggedy too jaggedy and aggressive. And they were basically like, no, we're fine, we're fine. Like, I couldn't find much about that. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't really post the results, but I mean, I guess they thought they were fine. But they did have an outcome. So whilst they didn't post their findings, they did decide to change something within St. Ives about their apricot scrub. And that was to simply ignore it and take the word walnut off their ingredient list. So what this supposedly proves here is that the quality, consistency of shape and size and smoothness of the walnut particles has always been a bit of an underlying issue that St. Ives will have to deal with or ignore. It's important to mention actually here that there are pictures of um, the walnut shell under a microscope, which I've tried to find my own picture of, but they have all been redacted, so they're not open for the public to see. I must say, reading through all these emails, however, it doesn't look like St. Ives is like trying to pull the wall over anyone's eyes, their consumer's eyes, or anything like that. It's, it's more about wanting the consumers to ignore all the bullshit about their products causing micro tears and feeling safe knowing that their products are safe to use. You know, not how do we hide the, the damage that's 
that's being caused by a product that's been used for decades, decades, half a century. No. Yeah, half a century sent a hundred, yeah. In fact, in the emails they say, we know this isn't true, we know micro tears causing bacterial infections is a load of bullshit. They don't say that, that's, you know, kind of what they say. And they opt to ignore these over sensationalized um, blog posts and kind of treat them as just like, fear mongering basically. All in all, the claim that the apricot scrub causes micro tears, damages the skin, causes acne, at least a premature aging, isn't looking very good for our plaintiffs at all actually. All they managed to do so far is explain how um, over exfoliation can damage your skin barrier and not that this is a unique issue to St. Ives apricot scrub in any way. In fact, they've actually proved more so that their original claim is a load of bullshit. Micro tears don't exist and therefore their evidence of articles about micro tears isn't good enough evidence, they back that up. So what about claims that the term dermatologist tested is misleading and suggests that a dermatologist has actually been involved and recommended this product. When there are dermatologists online who don't recommend this product whatsoever, and the dermatologist they hired to run the trial says, I will not recommend this to my to my patients. Well, to cut two very long, boring interviews short, in court, when Browning and Basil were asked if they understand what the term dermatologist tested meant, they both said it means the product has been tested by a dermatologist. When both asked what dermatologist recommended meant, they both explained that that means a dermatologist recommends this product to their patients and consumers, showing that they both very clearly understood the difference between dermatologist tested and dermatologist recommended. Their claims that the term dermatologist tested was misleading and confusing was thrown out as evidence because they just proved they understood the difference. But I get where they're coming from. Brands know what they're doing. To allude to the fact that a dermatologist was involved in the process of creating this product, they allude to the fact that dermatologists like this product by simply implying that a dermatologist is involved in any way, you know? So I do get that, but you can't go to court and be like, well, I know the difference. It's just not on, you know? You can't do that. At this point, I'm actually su surprised St. Ives isn't taking more legal action, like, counter suing or against these bloggers or anything like that because even to this day we believe that St. Ives alone as a product causes micro tears, right? Which which don't exist. There are hundreds, hundreds of skincare products that have the same walnut scrub in. Hundreds. Walnut, bamboo, charcoal scrubs even. All the same, yet St. Ives is still to this day the poster child of the micro tear myth. And you can see this online, you can see people leaving reviews for St. Ives, blaming St. Ives for facial deformations and co really confusing comments like this one. This is a comment on an article talking about the St. Ives lawsuit. I have just spent the last two days guiding slivers out of my face with quips through a sore that was created. My daughter thought I was on drugs for a hot minute, and my boyfriend thinks I'm crazy. But seriously, this needs to be off the shelf. I've used it for years and never had a problem, but this last purchase has left my skin a mess, and I imagine it's going to take a while to completely rid of the slivers. I do not want to tear my skin apart to get them out. Another user said, I had used this product for three years and my skin has little red holes and tears in it. It's so damaged now because of this product. So what's happening here is people are now reading that, that this product supposedly tears up your skin and causes infections. And now they're all instantly blaming St. Ives for this. Bearing in mind that they've been using St. Ives for forever in their own words and really hasn't been reformulated at all. This sounds like an issue from something else that they're using, something else that they're experiencing. They've seen professional, professional takes on what St. Ives does and has come to the conclusion that it has given them slivers and sores and red holes in their face. It's important to note that micro tears aren't visible to the naked eye. This is something that Mark S. Nestor says in his declaration that you cannot see these to, on the naked eye. Micro tears are not something you can see. You are not gonna have physical tears and holes in your skin. It's created like this hysteria, you know? It's created kind of like, so people are now like, yep, yeah, that's me. It must be St. Isaac did that to my skin. On that note, looking back at Mark S. Nestor's declaration, he does mention that one of the blog posts that everyone seems to be using as factual evidence, <laughs> mentions that when talking about the walnut shell itself, one term says, because of their irregular shape, the most abrasive scrubs are those containing ground fruit pits. And this brings us on nicely to the only real statement Unilever have ever really 
mentioned through this whole lawsuit and even up until now, telling the online magazine Racked that as a general practice, we do not comment on pending litigation. We can say that for over 30 years, consumers have loved and trusted the St. Ives brand to refresh and revitalize their skin. We are proud to be America's top facial scrub brand and stand by our dermatologist tested formula. When I was researching this, I remembered a TikTok from one of my favorite online dermatologists, Dr. Shah, where he did an investigation into St. Ives and spoke of a New York Times article where St. Ives claimed that the actual walnut scrub particles are finely milled and polished so that each particle has a smooth surface to promote safe and effective exfoliation. If this is true, then it would have been so easy to disprove this in court, shove it under a microscope and you see all your particles are nicely round balls or like curved, nice, nice shapes. Well, Dr. Shah actually took matters into his own hands and used his dermatologist microscope, I d they probably got a real name, I don't know, to instantly disprove this. Under the microscope, you can clearly, clearly see that the walnut particles are in fact pointy, jaggedy, different sizes, they're all over the shop, they're everywhere. So St. Ives basically lied. This was after the lawsuit, but yeah, just a side note. So yeah, before we get into the conclusion of this, I just kind of want to say how I feel about the scrub again. I need to emphasize that St. Ives, it's not my favorite brand. I'm never gonna purchase their products again after, like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna use up these cleansers, but I'm not gonna rush out and buy more of them. I'm definitely not gonna be using St. Ives apricot, apricot scrub because I have sensitive skin. I have rosacea prone skin. I don't want to scrub at my skin, but if you can effectively and gently use a, phys a physical exfoliant, there's no reason why you can't use St. Ives apricot scrub. When I was younger, it caused a lot of redness and irritation, but that's because I was misusing the product. I was under the impression that scrubbing meant you scrub at your skin and I would really irritate my skin, but that was my fault. In fact, one dermatologist, Rachel Nazarian, MD of the Schwager Dermatology Group in New York City, explains that whilst this is a cult favorite, everyone's skin is different. Just like with exfoliants of any kind, any kind, it will affect everyone's skin differently. She actually says that there's no reason why you can't use this safely, but does agree that the directions to use this three to four times a week is a little excessive and you shouldn't actually use it that much. She goes on to say that any physical scrub of any kind can cause irritation if you're using it aggressively, saying that even a washcloth can damage your skin if used incorrectly. So before we get into the conclusion conclusion, they, they do moisturizers too. This is a St. Ives Renewing Moisturizer. Collagen and elastin condition skin for youthful glow. Paraben free, ew. Oh. oh. No, I recognize that smell. Oh. <laughs> That's actually really nice. It's instantly calming and soothing and cooling on the skin. It's not greasy, but it's not overly, like it doesn't just disappear off your skin. I don't hate that at all, you know. Mm, okay. It's not my go-to, like, don't get me wrong, it's not now my go-to moisturizer, but I can see myself like, using it up with no issue. On that note, would I recommend people use this? No, I believe there are much nicer physical exfoliants that don't leave you as dry and like parched as St. Ives, but if you love it, then keep using it is what I would say. So we all know the claims against St. Ives and their creation of micro tears were tossed out of court this didn't go through. No one won this case, and rightfully so. I'm not a huge fan, but rightfully so. We've all been led to believe that micro tears are a real thing, that they exist, when in fact, it's just an oversimplification of damaging your skin barrier. And that is why it was thrown out of court, because people still can't prove that micro tears are a thing. Dermatologists have just admitted that is an oversimplified term for a damaged skin barrier. So get ready, because I'm about to read all the reasons why this was thrown out of court, all the ways that Basil and Browning basically shot themselves in the foot, and even that the dermatologist study here may have been rigged. It gets quite sassy and quite aggressive, actually. So the very first point, which we know, there were no injuries. No one could show any physical damage caused by St. Ives, and of course, they couldn't prove premature aging in any way whatsoever. The district court reviewed plaintiff's evidence and concluded that while plaintiffs offer some factual support that St. Ives disrupts the stratum corneum, the skin's protective barrier, they haven't shown that the alleged micro tears themselves are a safety hazard or differ from the effects of standard exfoliation. Lots of consumer goods that would flunk a risk benefit 
CrossFit tests are nevertheless fit to be sold. He says, suppose I'm on a diet and decide not to order dessert, or that I choose not to bike to work because I might get hit by a car. My individual choice doesn't mean the chocolate cake or bike aren't fit to be sold. <laughs> I told, told you it was gonna get sassy. The first piece of scientific evidence was in fact just blog posts and articles mentioning micro tears. The term micro tears was classed as junk science and nothing more than an internet hoax. We call this misinformation. In fact, the five bloggers who wrote these articles, which were used as evidence, four took their allegations and articles back completely against St. Ives, and one didn't show up for court at all. In fact, this whole case started because the two plaintiffs saw the internet hoax and decided they wanted a refund for products that they'd been happily using for decades before getting it in their eye. I failed to mention that in one of these blog posts, the dermatologist interviewed was a Dr. Katz, and they quote him as part of the evidence saying that St. Ives was harmful. However, the plaintiffs failed to mention that in that very same blog post, Dr. Katz actually she impeaches himself. Kat said he recommends using the apricot scented formula gently. He recommends using it. He adds, I only recommend using it every second or third day, particularly in the winter months when the skin gets quite dry and is even more prone to irritation. So they then move on to Dr. Nestor, whose clinical trial only proved, and in his own words, that he would not advise his patients to use St. Ives. Never did he support the plaintiff's claims that micro tears exist, that St. Ives scrub causes micro tears, or that the product itself shouldn't be sold. Their hopes that hiring a dermatologist to prove their point failed miserably, miserably. The plaintiffs clearly understood the difference between dermatologists tested and recommended, and in fact, the product is in fact dermatology, dermatologically tested by a Dr. Anita Cham. But ultimately, it wouldn't matter either way because despite plaintiff Basil saying that the claim, claim was misleading, she says that she didn't buy the product because of its claims. She actually bought it because her sister recommended it. Basil admitted in court that she didn't even look at the packaging when she first purchased the product. One point that comes to light that I say for now is that Miss Basil was actually seen a dermatologist around the time she bought her first St. Ives apricot scrub. After looking at Basil's skin, her dermatologist recommends she used a gentle cleanser. So what does she go out and buy? St. Ives fresh skin apricot scrub, <laughs> which has a clear indicator on the bottle that this is a deep exfoliator. And in fact, St. Ives do allude to the fact that they make gentler products. So she's not read the packaging, she's picked up a scrub in instead of a cleanser. So carrying on with the lawsuit, plaintiffs failed to raise a material factual dispute that the product caused unreasonable safety hazard. Basically, yeah, they had no evidence, but what about Mark Nestor's evidence? Well, in a mostly redacted document, Unilever lawyers and scientists actually point out many flaws in Dr. Nestor's clinical trial. It's a bit confusing because most of it was blanked out, but um, I'll try, I'll try. They conclude basically by saying, you either have symptoms or you don't. Dr. Nestor can't make day into night and he can't invent symptoms that plaintiffs did not experience. Whatever he saw, it can't have been the undetectable effect the complaint describes. Speaking of micro tears. As I mentioned, the pictures in Dr. Nestor's report have been redacted, however, they actually came late. They weren't included in the initial report. He didn't include these photographs of the subjects in his initial declaration. I wish we can see pictures because the court basically say from these pictures, you can see the subjects didn't suffer any redness. One, that was one of the big claims. You can actually see the skin improving in certain pictures. However, Dr. Nestor's report says that they were suffering from redness when they clearly weren't. Moving on, Dr. Nestor did not say the products cause long-term damage. He merely said the products can increase chances of infection, but so can shaving one's chin, they say, or clipping one's toenail. That doesn't mean razors or nail clippers are unfit to be sold. Even plaintiffs admit that the some degree of, ab of abrasion is consistent with the central purpose of a facial scrub. They go on to say that Dr. Nesta again instructed his subjects to stop using regular topical products, including moisturizers. But as Unilever's expert, Dr. Stebbins, pointed out, medical literature shows that failing to use a topical moisturizer by itself could alone count for the results that Dr. Nesta indicated he saw, even if the subjects had not used St. Ives. 
They actually go on to supply a study showing that failing to use a moisturizer can significantly impact trans epidermal water loss with no significant alteration of the stratum corneum. Plaintiffs had no answer to this. It's kind of alluded to the fact that Dr. Nesta was only gonna get paid if he came out with evidence that micro tears were real. So it looks like he kind of twisted his words to kind of kind of show that they were real. So he got paid. So how long have I been doing this for? I feel like I've been here forever. So to round up very, very simply, there's no case here because there's no damage. There's no evidence. There's no evidence of micro tears or that they exist. There's no evidence that St. Ives is different from any other form of exfoliation in potentially causing trans epidermal water loss, a damaged skin barrier, no, no reason why it should be canceled. They're suing just in case. It's really, I, I find it really odd. Again, not a huge fan of St. Ives. I'm gonna use up these products happily. Never this, I'll use this on my feet and my knees. Great budget buy is like, fine, knock yourself out. But this is a clear case of misinformation, radicalized media, media, whipping up a frenzy about a fake medical term that doesn't exist. And really that St. Ives is used as the punching bag for a whole category of skincare, being physical exfoliation. Yes, of course there are more gentler ways to exfoliate and I actually prefer those. And there are hundreds of products with jaggedy particles that no one ever talks about. And whilst I will always prefer chemical exfoliation, if you love this, if physical exfoliation works for you, knock yourself out, continue to use it. There are some amazing physical exfoliants that I love. Uh, Make do a great one. But yeah, I find this so interesting. Oh, do you know they do hand cream? I bought like 10 of these by accident. Let's see, this is vitamin E and avocado. But yeah, it's weird because I I would be the first person to be like, don't use St. Ives apricot scrub. Like it's not good. And I still be like that. But I think the sensationalized kind of like micro tear, this whole kind of like, people are still yet to prove what micro tears are. Pretending it's anything other than just a damaged skin barrier, I find so strange. A little bit too greasy though. Not a huge fan of that. Like this is gonna take me a while to rub in. I better leave it here then. You can watch, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Whether you love or hate um, St. Ives, I know it's kind of like Marmite, you either love it or you hate it. You can watch the rest of a series here and some general light entertainment here and I'll see you over there. Yeah.